Mulweni. Difunani hapa. <laughs> oh, sorry, English. Why am I here? Why am I standing in front of all of you today? I'm sure quite a few of you are thinking, well, because you're the speaker and it'll be quite awkward if you're here for some other reason. Correct, but the question that I pose to you today is deeper than that. And now please, allow me to take you through the ups and downs of my life in an attempt to try and clarify that question. And just a disclaimer, there is absolutely nothing special about my background. In fact, there was nothing special about my life for a very long time. But then, why am I here? I was born in an isolated village called Nyongwan. It's in the Eastern Cape. Um, it's about 40 or so kilometers from our main town, Queenstown. Now, when I say village, <laughs> place redefines the word village. You get a hut half a kilometer in the neighbor. There was no electricity and no running water. And yes, that did imply that the basic sanitation wasn't great. But when I was born, my mother was very young. She was about 19 and was in grade 11. So while my mother was at school, my gran would take care of me. Nyongwane, as I've said, was extremely rural, but I have to admit, it sort of fits the stereotype that quite a few foreigners have about Africa. You know, the whole being chased by lions in the streets idea. Because when I was about five, I had my puppy eaten by a Cape Cobra not more than 200 meters away from home. So my mother finally matriculated at the age of 21 and went to the Eastern Cape to further studies. And I remained in the, Western Cape, in the Eastern Cape, sadly. Now, some of you might be wondering where my father is at this point. Well, your guess is as good as mine. But there's nothing special about that. I mean, there are so many kids without fathers. In fact, I would have found it more weird to have a father than not, because none of the kids that I knew had fathers. So then, why am I here? When I turned six, I also ventured to the Western Cape, to a township called Crossroads in Nyanga. Now, quite a few people know where Nyanga is, but they don't really know what Nyanga is. Now, allow me to draw a picture for you. It occupies an area of about three square kilometers. Um, it has a population of about 58,000 people, 5,800 people. 58,000, that was correct. That does mean that the population density, if you do the math, is around 19,000 people per square kilometer, which is 36 times greater than that of Constantia and 11 times more densely populous than New York. If everyone in this room lived in Nyanga, Every single year, one of you would be killed and two sexually assaulted. Basically, what I'm trying to say is it wasn't the most nurturing place for a child to grow up. But I was just way too happy to get a flushing toilet, so that all didn't matter to me. My mother was living with a sister, my aunt, who sold counterfeit clothes to make a living. Now, unless you consider going to bed with hot water and sugar as lavish, who are struggling. However, that's not special at all. I mean, there are so many kids that go to bed without a proper supper anyway. Then, why am I here? So my aunt saw a business opportunity in Hans Bai, and I moved with her and we left my mother at home in Crossroads. Now, Hans Bar is widely known for its exhilarating shark cage diving, and many consider it the gem of the overbird. Now, please allow me to mar that image a bit. 
In Khanspara, I lived in a very small township. One thing I must admit was quite admirable about the place was the extremely low crime rate. I actually don't remember hearing about any crimes but one, Palamoon poaching. As a matter of fact, I didn't even know it was a crime until I turned 14. Now, at the end of my grade three year, my mother finished her social sciences degree. Everyone was so happy, I was like, yeah, I'm gonna be millionaires at last. <laughs> Little did I know. Well, I then moved to live with her in Cape Town and she could now take care of me. But in my moving back, a surprise awaited me. My father had returned. So now, I mean, now all should be perfect. We're a paragon of a normal family. Not really. Well, my father's unemployed. My mother's working, but most of her money is going to student loans. So we're still struggling, like most households in this country anyway. So then, why am I here? Now, if there's one thing that I know is that my mother really wanted to give me a good education. So she decided to stretch herself and send me to an English school. There's a school in Manenberg called Hedefal Primary School, and I enrolled in there in grade four. Now, I've just gone from a closer speaking school to an English school. I remember on my first day, my mother couldn't take me in, so I had to man up, or rather boy up at the time. I had a teacher come up to me. She said something very long and complicated. I just looked up at her. I was quite cute back then. I just smiled and gave her a nod. Because I had absolutely no clue what she had just said. Much like if you know nothing about physics and someone comes up to you and says, you know, gravitational waves are ripples in the curvature of space-time that propagate as a wave traveling outward from the source. Whatever you just said. I later found out that all the teacher wanted to know was my name and grade. As you can imagine, I did an exceptional job at failing my first term of grade four. But then again, so many kids fail anyway. I mean, with such a high failure rate, what are you talking about? Why is that special? Why am I here? In a period of two years, I managed to acquire enough English to become the top academic of the school and the head boy. I made it just in time academically for what was to become my biggest break. Okay, I was, I need, to, I need to put my acting face for this one. So in grade seven, we got a group of speakers coming to our school called Students for a Better Future. This is all serious. I remember sitting on the hard, cold floor. I was thinking, this is probably going to be one of those long, boring talks that we really have only one thing to gain from, painful buttocks. But I went home confused that day. And these people came into our school all dressed up nicely, and they told us that, you know, we are offering learners the opportunity to go study at the best schools in the West End Cape. You just got to go through an exam, and then you have an interview. And to stay in the scholarship, all you have to do is try your best. I didn't laugh, but I was expecting them to say, then we're going to make you our slaves or something. Well, that didn't come. So, uh, My mother thought this whole scholarship thing was a scam to try and get us into debt. However, after a bit of a discussion, it is, we decided we didn't really have much to lose. So we were going to do this. After long hours of preparation, of which involved me reading my first book, Screw It, Let's Do It, by Richard Branson, test day finally came. I was looking all smart, I was self-assured. I'm like, OK, we're going to do this. When I got to the venue, and saw the army of grade sevens ready to write. My dreams were shattered. The exam itself was quite interesting, to say the least. 
So after that day, I was pretty sure I wasn't going to be attending any fancy high school. I would just be attending normal township school like most South African kids. But then, why am I here? A few weeks after, I got back to find my mother smiling from ear to ear. She just received a phone call from Students for a Better Future saying that I had gotten through the exam phase. Now I was so happy and the domestic felicity was so high. That was my proudest moment. And then the interview came. Honestly, all I remember doing was smiling till my cheeks started hurting. Obviously that worked because a few weeks after, they called and said I'd gotten the scholarship. Confessedly, this was not because, the happiness that is, it wasn't because I would be attending Weinberg Boys, which is one of the top schools in the country and the Western Cape, but because I would be attending what most black people incorrectly believe to be a white school. And my fellow classmates were equally happy for me with the one fear that I would deem myself too good for them once I'd met with white people. On the 28th of August, 2008, my life would take a sharp turn. No, <laughs> we didn't win the lottery or anything. As I got back from school, I remember seeing a fleet of cars parked in front of my house, and I identified most of them to be family members. I got home, and all eyes were on me. Pe people looked at me with teary eyes, and there were murmurs amongst the women. Does he know? Does he know? My father sat on the couch with his eyes drowning in tears. And my baby, baby brother, who was two at the time, ran from the bathroom to his lap. There was only one possibility, death. So my mother had passed away. By the time my aunt told me that my mother had passed away, the only piece of information that I really wanted to know was how. She was, hit by, she was hit by a golden hour bus. Maybe I shouldn't have asked. So now, I have no mother, a two-year-old brother, and an unemployed father. Oh, one more thing. We also had 10,000 rands from golden arrows, which are supposed to support us for the unforeseeable future. Not quite the perfect family I'd hoped for. So then, how am I here? I remember asking myself, where do we go from here? With the pillar of my family gone, my future seemed bleak. My family was split. I mean, my brother was taken in by my aunt from Hans Bai. My father was living in a shack in KTC, and I was living with another aunt in Philippi. I was also in grade seven, SPF, that's the scholarship I was in, ran a series of Saturday classes to help prepare us for high school. I must admit, I didn't enjoy losing my Saturdays until I saw how useful they were in high school. Now, when SPF organized post-traumatic counseling is when I began to realize this was more than a scholarship. I pushed through the last few months of grade seven and managed to get straight A's. But like, even with the feeling that SPF was more than a scholarship, I still felt that it was sponsored by some, I don't know, corporate establishment. Now, when I heard that at our, at our induction ceremony, we would be meeting the couple behind it all, I was taken aback. I remember walking onto the stage to hug a beaming Mrs. Strongman and shake the hand of Dr. Strongman. Now, the transition from a primary school in Mannenberg 
for one of the best high schools in the country seemed like a daunting task. Thankfully, the headmaster, Mr. Richardson, managed to make a place for me at boarding school, which would help ease my transition. However, with the support and with the warm brotherhood of the school, it did not take long to settle down. The camaraderie amongst fellow Ombig men is something that I will forever carry with me. I have great memories from big rugby games, numerous fundraisers to sleepovers at school. I have no doubt that Wamba Boys was the best place for me. Even though I do have a few odd behaviors from there, like picking up packets of litters that I didn't eat, <laughs> to greeting strangers. At this very school is where I met my mentor, Julian Taylor, who's the primary reason why I'm doing physics right now. And my decision was cemented when SPF organized faculty days for us at UCT. I'm now studying physics at the University of Cape Town, and I've been blessed with the opportunity of having a full scholarship by the students. But like a few months ago, I was told that a few good friends of mine had been killed in gang-related violence. Many of my other classmates had become either high school dropouts or gangsters. But I mean, their stories began exactly as mine did. Were they just not as special? Well, I'm here today as an archetype of what can be of an ordinary child when small things and big things come together to give him an opportunity to change his life. Now, many of you might be bored, but if you to take one thing out of this talk, please let it be this. It's a quote by Dr. Maraboli. He said, every single time you help somebody stand up, you are helping humanity to rise. I hope you're hearing this. He said, every single time you help somebody stand up. You are helping humanity to rise. Thank you. <laughs>